it's, it's two o'clock, so I'll, I will just start. Hi, I'm Alan Atkinson. I'm the Director of Visual Arts for the Oklahoma Arts Council. Um, our ordinary hostess, Jerrica, cannot be with us this afternoon, so I am stepping in, and my main function here is to introduce our guest speaker, Deborah Ashheim. She creates large-scale immersive installations, sculptures, and drawings based on invisible worlds of memory, communication, transportation, and information. Her work attempts to reconcile the physical structures of the built environment with the human experiences that buildings and cities contain and support. Ashheim received her MFA from the University of Washington. She has received an artist resource for completion grant from the Center for Cultural Innovation and a mid-career artist fellowship from the California Community Foundation. Ashheim has exhibited extensively across the United States and internationally. And without further ado, I turn it over to you, Deborah. Welcome to Oklahoma. Thanks, I wish I was actually really there. Um, but this is cool that we can do this. So this is a, we're try I'm trying to think of reasons why Zoom is good. Um, so great to see you all today. And um, like I was saying to people that were early in the waiting room, I put together a kind of an unorthodox talk for me. I usually um, show what I'm working on or my greatest hits or whatever, but I kind of made a talk that's a little bit more for hopefully for artists or for art people who um, are, uh, are interested in, um, uh, in transitioning into doing public art. So I'm very interested in, um, trying to help make public art more inclusive and more user-friendly for artists. So I kind of have focused on the transition from studio work to working with fabricators, because that was something that Jerrica and I talked a lot about. So um, hopefully this will go okay, because I'm gonna show you guys some stuff that I have never shown anybody except for maybe public art project managers. So here I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, great. So this is actually the last exhibition I had before everything got shut down by COVID-19. This was a this is a studio project that I've been working on for a few years. I'm making this uh, imaginary sort of dream city that's cobbled together out of misremembered buildings from around the world. It originally was a, commission, a temporary public art project for Tom Bradley International Terminal at LAX Airport, where disoriented international travelers would encounter this mashup sort of dream city as they were coming out of the sort of like dreamlike state of a long international flight. But this is at um, Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. So this is just sort of like for introduction. And then, come on. Wait. Oh, here we go. And then I've also, I also have been making a lot of drawings. Um, I always make a lot of drawings, but I make drawings a lot from uh, community engagement and civic actions that I participate in. So they're, I'm sort of witnessing and documenting history that I'm part of. Um, and I post these, you can, the um, website that I put these on is at the bottom of the image. It's called neverfacebook.com. So these are from, uh, I think it was November 9th, the day that the election was um, declared in 2020. These are from uh, last summer, not the summer we just had, but summer 2020. Um, and this is just to give some context. This is a lot of the stuff I've just been doing in my studio lately. But when I first started doing public art, so why is this not advancing? Hang on. You guys can see the images, right? Okay. Yes. Um, usually the, oh, here we go. Okay, something was slightly different. All right. So this is the kind of installations that I was making that's probably a little bit more like the description um, that, um, that you guys just heard um, when I first started doing public art. And the way that it works in LA is you don't really decide to do public art. If you get an um, individual artist grant from the city of Los Angeles, you automatically get put on this list. And if they, um, and so they might call you and say, do you want to do a public art project? And you're broke and you're teaching part-time and you're like, yeah, sure, why not? So, th so this was from a series that I did called Neural Architecture. It was a three-year project. It was a series of nervous systems for buildings. And I was like, how the heck am I going to translate these giant, huge labor intensive things that require an army of volunteers and are only up for a few months um, into something permanent um, that can be fabricated to last forever and not break. So um, I, this is an installation I did at the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it was tiny little pocket televisions, which is something, an antique thing that they don't have anymore, that played um, fragments of home movies. And it was trying to make 
the neural structures of my own autobiographical memories um, visible. And I was sort of done with this project and I was thinking, well, maybe we can translate something like this into public art. So I'm gonna show you a, just a couple projects. I'm gonna sort of walk you through them. So I, I reached out to my, I have an amazing fabricator. And the reason he's amazing is I think he's somebody that maybe would have wanted to be an artist if things had gone differently. And he has a big sign shop in Milwaukee um, and he mostly makes commercial signs, but kind of like really cool ones. Um, but then he does projects for a few artists. Um, and I think for him, he doesn't always, he's not really that concerned with the bottom line. He, it's more that it helps him stay creative and, and maybe it helps, I think it helps him be competitive in his industry to do these other projects. So I said, Adam, his name's Adam, can we, um, can we translate something like this into a public art project? So I got it asked by, and I never, this is the only time I ever did a private commission. I usually only do public commissions, but I got asked by Vulcan Inc., which is the contractor firm that was building the campus of amazon.com in Seattle to make something for this funny window space. So it's sort of ideal because it's like outdoors, but it's almost like a museum case. So, um, sorry, we have an election tomorrow, so it's crazy here. Um, so I was like, okay, well, how am I going to picture the space? So this is my old studio, and I basically taped out the space, and I um, and I sort of translated what these things I've been making by hand, you know, could be for the monitors, and I tried to um, and picture it. So this is an, this is my friend from across the hall's assistant posing to show you scale, and then I drew it. So this is the plans from the building. And then Adam and I sort of came up with this idea that we would use like flat screen monitors that, that, that are the kind that they use in display kiosks and they're um, high brightness so they show really good in the day. And we would translate my handmade things which were actually made from uh, reusable ice cubes from Bed Bath & Beyond that I shoved LEDs into. So we figured we probably needed something a little bit more solid state than that. And we designed, and then Adam made these, um, these models for me in his shop and then he uh, created a kind of a mold for rotoscoping. And this guy's crazy. This is why I love this guy. And then he built a rotoscoping machine. And so a rotoscoping machine, basically what he did was he made these shells and then he pours resin in. And then he built this crazy machine that like for 24 hours, it sort of like rotates the shell thing so that it can build up a thin film of um, resin um, that creates these, uh, these hollow forms. And then this is what we came up with. There's feet for scale. That's that's a big man's feet. These are big. Um, and then we had to figure out the wiring diagram and um, and and how everything was going to get power. And then here we are in Seattle, um, laying everything out and trying to use my drawings to figure out where things are going to go. So you can see these things got sort of big. And then this is the finished installation. So I figured this isn't this isn't the first thing I ever did, but this is maybe one of the easiest ones to understand. Um, and we used color changing LEDs, so and we programmed it to do different things at different times of day. It's actually the bottom floor of a of a big um, building at Amazon where the programmers write the code that tells the robots what warehouse to go to to get your thing that you ordered. I wanted to do something where I got to show you like every 10,000 thing that was bought on Amazon, but they are really proprietary. So we had separate feeds, but I also co collaborated with two other artists to create dynamic content works that are fed off the internet and the content changes all the time. I think I put the website in on the last one, but you can see how the reason I want to show you this was like, because I thought that was the hardest part in the beginning it was was taking my studio stuff that I made by hand in a very spontaneous and improvisational progress process and keeping some of that feel, but transitioning it to things that could be permanent and coordinate with architects, design teams, contractors, and all of the other like project stakeholders. I think that for me was like the hardest part in the beginning. You can see in the um, top of this image, I actually went around Seattle and Amazon campus and um, spied on people from the tops of buildings and made a hand-drawn um, surveillance video. I'll, I think the videos are all on my website. Um, the cool thing about um, a corporate client was in the, in one of the meetings. They said, "I said, um, they said, well, it's very much about surveillance because oh, the idea was it's called Periscope, and the idea was that in the basement of technology buildings." this thing, which is what I visualize the internet might look like, is like secretly gestating. It kind of came out of my neural architecture idea. So some of it, this is um, looping videos that I created too from found footage of people doing all different kinds of work going back to like the 20s. 
Okay, so I'll show you one other project just to sort of walk you through this. Um, I hope this is making sense. It made sense in my head. So I, so as part of neural architecture, I also did a series called Arborization that were kind of like trying to make a connection between the um, organic environment, like the ecosystems, and then the systems of the body, which could be like the nervous system or the circulatory system, and then the power grid of cities. So this is an installation at the Armory Center for the Arts. It was actually part of neural architecture, that first thing I showed you with the, the sort of jelly jellyfish-like thing with the hundreds and hundreds of lit up little lamp cells. Um, in this case, I took out the windows of the building and replaced them with plexiglass windows with hold, holes drilled in them. And then this tubing seeped out of the building and there were motion sensors. And as you walk by the trees, these, these uh, trees lit up. And this is another time I did a similar um, version of this piece for uh, Laumeier Sculpture Park in St. Louis. And so it doesn't seem related, but this is just kind of like the backstory of the public project. I got invited to do um, a commission for um, for Pocket Greenhaven Library, which was a branch library in Sacramento. And I was like, oh, cool, I love the library. But it turned out I didn't really know anything about the library. Like I was thinking of libraries as where they keep the books. And actually libraries are amazing. Like libraries are community centers and they have classes and their childcare and their job training and their access to the, to the you know, they, they, fix, they uh, ameliorate the digital divide because it's where people can get access to computers that don't have um, that kind of technology at home. But one of the things that amazed me, because I've been in universities for a long time, was that they used the Dewey Decimal System. And I was used to the Library of Congress system, which is really complicated. But the Dewey Decimal System, it's really flawed, but it's such a kind of a beautiful idea. It tries to organize all knowledge into 10 categories, which is like impossible, right? So I thought that was kind of beautiful. And I and it was and this and this branch library was in kind of a suburban neighborhood. You might not really know what it was. So I decided to just basically try to make a connection between what's going on outside of the building and what's and the collections inside. But also I was really in love with the idea of how they build the opening day collection and the idea that the collection of the library is almost a portrait of what the community is thinking. So this is a the data on the like the library, the most nearby library that had the same kind of demographics as this library, but I actually based my artwork on the opening day collection. And so this is a plant-like form that I imagine based on the 10 um, branches of the Dewey Decimal System. It's basically just a data chart, right? So anything that there was a lot of got a bigger branch. So there weren't that many um, philosophy and psychology books, but of the ones there were, there was like a lot of self-help. And so, you know, you can sort of see that over in the corner. The big thick branches are like fiction, which includes like um, children's books, you know, so there was a lot and, um, and arts because that included um, all the CDs and DVDs that they had back then because this is like 2007. And so I was trying to make a realistic representation of what the collection might look like as an imagined plant, but then some things were just whimsical like I really love that vampires was a statistically significant, you know, uh, element of teen fiction so that got its own little branch and so this is this drawing translated into a glowing artwork for the outside of Robbie Waters pocket Greenhaven um, Sacramento library and it again slowly sort of changes color because we were really into that back then and what Adam did was he took the things I've been doing and he created for this one he he learned how to to weld these kind of armature structures and then um, and then sort of slump formed fiberglass over them and then I went to Milwaukee with them and we um, we airbrushed paint on them to make them a translucent blue so that it would look beautiful in the day because it only looks beautiful from the light at night because it's crazy bright in Sacramento. So that's just taking you through another one. But really for the past five or 10 years, a lot of my work has been very much about um, community engagement. And, I, and, also, and I've been trying to do a lot of work that's about like oral history and making connections between the social justice movements of the 1960s and the world that we live in now. So this is a public art project I did for um, the city of San Francisco. They have this really cool project called Art on Market. Art on Mar Market is 36 bus kiosks and bus stops, like basically bus posters. You know how they usually, well, back before COVID, they would have movie posters on the, at the bus stops. I don't know what they have now because we don't have movies anymore, but, um, but in San Francisco, they took 36 of them and they let artists program them. So they, ha they have an open call with a different theme every year and artists propose 
um, a sort of a narrative series of installations or it could be design or sometimes it's photographers and you walk down Market Street and you see all the artworks. And, I, and for the year that I did it, it was um, the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, which for anyone that's younger, you've never heard of that, you don't know what it is, but it was like the where they say they invented like sex, drugs and rock and roll in the 60s. But what I was really interested in was the radical activist and alternative like literary and um, cultural history of San Francisco. So I went up to uh, the Bancroft Library at University of California, Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz Library and there are a bunch of other libraries, the LGBTQ Historical Society. And I just hit the archives and found like orphaned images that have been, that were like old negatives or, you know, um, just like really, really starts through to find some, some images that were unfamiliar or maybe were never gonna be seen again, rehabilitated them with drawing and then married them to oral histories that I collected. This is a quote from Kathleen Cleaver, who was the um, Minister of Education, I think, or Communications for the Black Panther Party, which formed in Oakland, California in 1966. Um, and um, they're sort of well known for their, um, uh, they're protecting the community from police violence, but they also pioneered a lot of amazing programs like uh, free um, uh, breakfast for kindergarten kids and free public health clinics. Um, this is a very famous anti-war protest um, in San Francisco. And all of the things that I drew took place right where, right where you were. So this also started on Market Street and was a big part of the anti-Vietnam War movement, also you know, 50 years before. This was a, a forgotten group called the Vanguard, which was a very, very early gay rights group. It was homeless teenagers, but they, unlike the kids that flocked to San Francisco to be part of like the groovy summer of love and sleep in the park, these guys had been kicked out of their homes because they were gay and that was, it was 1966 and that was actually still illegal. And so they had done a tongue in cheek protest. They had borrowed brooms from the city of San Francisco and use them to sweep up Market Street to show that they contribute to society, but also as a tongue in cheek criticism of the police sweeping them up for vagrancy, which is a crime of just like hanging out. So anyways, um, I, get, I came back to Pasadena, California, which is where I live. Mm -hmm. And I had liked this project so much that I proposed one to the city of Pasadena that I funded with an individual artist grant. And this, um, th for this project, I interviewed about 30 people who were teenagers in 1968, but now were like at the retirement end of their career and had, had participated in the East LA and Pasadena high school student walkouts. So in 1968, students from across East LA banded together and um, walked out of school to protest discrimination against them in the public schools. And, um, and a lot of them went on to become uh, administrators and vice presidents and equity um, deans at various colleges and they were they were really amazing and so um, so this is sort of backstory for how did I translate oh and this was also um, it was at, um, at the bus stops but also in English and Spanish on all the buses sharing the stories so when when I um, got asked to do public art commissions following these temporary projects I wanted to bring some of that community engagement and historical research into my projects so in Oh, a long time ago, I think it was 2015, I got invited to, uh, or I got selected to be the artist for a new fire station in Santa Monica. And I worked with the architect, this was not what I originally proposed actually, but he was amazing. His name's Rob Quigley. And he, um, and he agreed to redesign all of the interior glazing and create this giant wall of windows where I could tell the story of Santa Monica Fire Department. And I researched the history going back to the 18. 80s when it had been like horse-drawn fire apparatus and all these sort of famous fires. And then I also spent several years as artists in residence for the fire department, going on ride-alongs with them, observing them, going on administrative things like um, doing the safety inspections and in, um, commercial buildings and uh, training at the fire academy, but also just doing goofy stuff like going with them to the grocery store to buy dinner. And um, so this, I'm just gonna tell you like, how do my drawings get translated into a large scale permanent installation? Well, if you're really lucky and the project has a big budget, you get to work with Franz Meyer of Munich and they're amazing. They're the premier art glass fabricators in uh, Germany. They used to make the stained glass windows for all the cathedrals of Europe. And then when those were all finished, they started working with artists. And so the way we translated my work was I took my drawings and I drew them at 50% of scale as like really perfect line drawings that then they used to etch the glass. And then I flew to Munich for a week and they have an apartment that they put you up at in their, in their factory. And, um, and you train like your favorite artist and person you have the best rapport with 
to make to to do to paint the ceramic melting colors onto the glass, replicating your brushstrokes. So this is Klaus, who I adore, and he's painting. You can see in the background, he's painting my watercolor of the firefighters eating dinner at the old station, so that it when it gets fired in these giant, huge, like five by nine foot kilns, these huge windows will look like I painted them. And so this is um, this is uh, Ziggy Hernandez waiting to get shipped to LA. You can sort of see the, the German factory behind him. And then um, this is my huge regret because of COVID. We still haven't. This there's a this is for, this is a wall that divides the fire station from a community room that's available to the community to program. And since the fire station has never opened to the public, even though it opened in 2020, I've never. I still am waiting to get good pictures of this artwork because they basically use it for storage and this is the clearest one. So this is when they're still installing, but you can see the artworks installed. And then um, you can see the, the piece that Klaus was working on is in the, on the wall in the background. There's actually several sections of artwork, but this is the finished work. So that was really fun. And then, um, and then I made so many drawings because it was so fascinating to me and I had so many conversations with the firefighters that we also made a book. And so this book has excerpts from my interviews with the firefighters and all the other drawings that didn't make it into the artwork. And because it was a book, we, I got to talk about things that the firefighters never talked about, like how do they handle trauma? How do they handle PTSD? Some of the hard things about their job. And the thing about this project that was great was it wound up costing more than they expected. So they said to me at some point, if you have more money, what would you want to do? And I said, can we make a hundred page eight and a half by 11 book and just give it out to everybody, all the firefighters and distribute it to the community for the libraries. And they said, yes. And so the other thing I'm really interested in a lot lately is trying to find ways to decouple some of the public art funding from the capital projects and make them available in other ways, whether that's temporary projects that can be really accessible, if, you know, cause not that many people are gonna really go into the fire department, into the fire station, you know, and so, but, or doing print projects or things that you can give away, even if it's only a thousand people that get the book, cause that's as many as we could afford to make. I think it's, um, it, it's great for the firefighters and it's like refreshing and exciting to people to think of public art as something that they can take home as and own and maybe helps reconnect them with the, the idea that they also own the public building. So this is another one of these glass pieces that I did. This is for Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center, which is a really amazing brain and spinal cord um, rehab hospital in Downey, California, that's part of LA County Public Health. And um, and in this case, it was kind of a funny project. Originally, they were gonna have a design firm create like the mission statement for this space and they didn't like what they came up with. So they threw it out to artists. And so again, I you know hit the archives and I wound up doing a timeline with English and Spanish captions of the history of Rancho, which had originally in the 1880s been LA County Poor Farm. And then it was a polio hospital. And now it's this amazing brain and spinal cord research hospital, but they almost closed it down in, in 1999 because they said it was too expensive. And the patients had a tent city and a 45 day protest and they got um, disability rights activists to help them sue to keep the hospital open. And now it's like a jewel in LA County Public Health and they have wellness programs and they have a wheelchair dance program. And it's just this amazing, totally inspiring place. And so, um, and it, so uh, the other reason I want to show you this work was that um, we brought back the, um, the things that we designed, those rotoscoped resin housings for the monitors. We brought those back out of retirement and we reconfigured them for to be wall pieces to talk about um, Rancho programs. And then I created uh, four channels of video in collaboration with Rancho patients and Rancho wellness community. So um, the wheel, people in some of the wheelchair sports wore GoPros on their head and showed all the amazing things that people can do, even though they're um, para or quadriplegic. And then um, this is uh, um, Ozme. Um, she was one of a, a, a group that we did a workshop and all the um, participants in the group showed their life from their point of view. The purpose of the artwork is for families and patients that are adjusting to a new life-changing traumatic injury or illness. So the overriding goal that was like the client's goal, but I was totally down with this, was to let people know that they've come to the right place and that their life will still be rich and fulfilling even though it will be different. So I, you know, sometimes something can be client driven and you're still totally okay with that. Um, okay, I don't know how we're doing on time. I was just gonna quickly show you some stuff I've been doing lately. Are we still okay? We are, we're doing okay. great. 
Okay, so um, so this is a public art project that had, was absolutely not related to a new building. In 2019 to 2020, um, I was hired um, through the LA County Board of Supervisors Equity and Inclusion Initiative to be the creative strategist slash artist in residence for LA County Registrar Recorder County Clerk. And that is the department that oversees all elections in LA County. We have an election in Los Angeles. Uh, in LA, or actually all of California tomorrow. So it's a branch of the Secretary of State, but LA County is the largest and most diverse electoral district in the country. We have 10 million residents. We have more voters in LA County than 44 of the United States. So um, this is uh, part of what I made as, um, as artists in residence for county elections. But um, Basically, my job was to use art strategies to do outreach to historically underrepresented communities of voters. I did a lot of different projects, but one of the main things I did was a project I made up called Next Generation of Voters, where I worked with students at 10 um, public universities, Cal, Cal State universities and community colleges to use the art communication and design departments to be the get out the vote army for the 2020 elections. So this is Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, the students there did a project called, um, oh, what was it called? I don't, I'm not sure what it was called. But anyways, it was, they basically made portraits of um, the people that inspire them to vote. And the portraits were so, and they had to learn, we, I had to coordinate with the classes so they were learning about monochromatic color. So they wound up doing it each one in one color, which wound up looking great. And there's, but the stories on the day of the critique, when they told me why they had painted the person were so great that I wound up producing them as a set of 20 trading cards that each one had um, the portrait on the front and then had the story on the back. And then the university liked them so much that they adopted this project as their get out the vote strategy because they had actually a vote center on campus and they made giant posters of it and they split the production costs with me. So these are some of the students with their cards. And this is what it looked like on the front and the back. And it also told you where and how to vote and when. So this was her, um, her grandmother who actually was undocumented. I don't think we put that on the card. Um, this guy was talking about his dad who came from, um, I think it was from Iran. Um, anyways, they all, they all had uh, the stories of why they vote. This was uh, Cal State LA where one of the design teachers um, invited the students to do a project, a poster project for me as their final project. And so again, like the university adopted the project. And this one was so great because all he, really, he the, the student, um, Put the messaging in Spanish, and then he also adopted the graphic style of the um, of, of self help graphics and the and the graphics of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, which um, in the nineteen sixties and seventies. So, um, so this these posters spoke to everyone, but he wanted to give a particular shout out to the Latinx community because he was distressed at the under voting of the Latinx community, and um, and uh, yeah, and it was they were great. Um, this was Cal State, Cal State Northridge. These guys were like, we're punks. We want to do events. This was before COVID. So they uh, made stencils and they would airbrush them right onto people. Um, and so then they would, and then they would just show up at every other event, like the gallery or home opening or homecoming. And then anybody that was willing to, they would just stencil um, these pro voting slogans right onto people's clothes. Or if people didn't want to um, sacrifice their clothes, then they could have a tote bag with any one of the designs. And then I just did this with, like at every single school until the election finally was this is Compton College where they had literally no resources. We just did SUNY brush painting. And then I also did a project called um, 365 Days of Voters, which actually wound up including over 750 people. And when COVID started, I transitioned this to a social media project, but it's basically um, you know, 750 people that I met and that they told me their reasons for voting. And then we posted them on Instagram and you can see that this project, if you go to at 365 days of voters, along with the reasons why everybody voted. And I tried to reach out to every community that I could and then people were reshared on their social media to try to be influencers to get other people to vote. So um, I also did a, still did a lot of in-person, very COVID safe um, in 2020 because there were some groups I wasn't gonna reach otherwise like this young man. Um, couldn't vote because he um, was uh, at the time you couldn't vote if you were on parole. I think now they've changed that lot in LA. But I worked with Homeboy Industries, and he wanted to um, talk about how he was really eager to get his voting rights back. I went down to um, food banks in Compton because I want to make sure I represented people from low wealth communities. And this was a homeless guy from Echo Park who wanted people to know that you can still vote if you're experiencing homelessness. 
at least in LA. So um, since I have a good relationship with the bus company from doing all these bus projects, they, I partnered with the city clerk in Pasadena and we put the posters in English and Spanish on the bus to try to reach out to um, people that maybe weren't on my, in my social media network. And then the last thing I'll show you really quickly is as part of my going around to get out the vote and these drawings are on never Facebook, I met families who were in, impacted by law enforcement violence and they were out, out trying to um, reach out to voters because we're, they wanted to um, uh, get support for a progressive district attorney that was running last year. And this is the family of Anthony Vargas. And, um, and I wound up partnering with this group um, as part of LA County Department of Mental Health, We Rise Mental Health Awareness Festival. They wanted to um, commission projects that were about the intersection of um, mental health and social justice. And we made some resource guides and little zines that talk about the intersection of um, mental health and social justice, particularly um, as it has to do with people having a mental health crisis and alternatives to 911, and also um, grief counseling and healing and legal aid. So these zines told stories um, from some of the families impacted by law enforcement violence alongside drawings that I made. Um, there's a resource guide um, in English and Spanish for people that um, get help for um, various kinds of mental health. And then also I worked with uh, artists and activists and the families and their supporters. Some people considered themselves artists. Some people made stuff that they shared on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and with their friends, but didn't consider themselves artists. But um, it was really amazing and fun to work with this community. And we created this scene. This was a family that goes every month and places flowers where their son was, um, was shot by and an officer involved incident. And so um, we turned that into a class as the centerfold of one of the books. And um, finally, this is an Instagram that I made last week um, where I'm posting drawings that I make for the families of their lost loved ones. So it's just kind of a gift thing that I do for healing. And so if you go to justice.drawings, you can see the drawings that I make, which unfortunately I have to say, I meet more and more families that need drawings um, every, every few weeks but um so anyways this project is ongoing and that's that's it is that good is that okay <laughs> that was faster than i thought but i hope I hope that was all right you, you brought it home early we have yeah we have i know i know i think i get so worried on zoom that i'm gonna i you know i had one zoom thing where i talked over someone else's time and i've been so traumatized from that that i think i but let's have more questions then. Yeah, I think, um, you know, gosh, so much great content. I know we're gonna have some great questions. So uh, let's just open it up and and uh, I, I'll start. I wanna know more about the hand-drawn surveillance video. That phrase just like grabbed me. It's like, ooh, I don't know what that is, but I need to know more. All right, so what I, what I did was I actually went around the world now that I'm remembering. And I started drawing people from the top of parking structures. And just from like, once I was at like the opera in Berlin and I was just like on the second floor balcony, just all these places. Well, I didn't draw them there. I just took pictures of them and drew them. And somehow um, people like, like hand-drawn surveillance doesn't creep people out the way that photographic surveillance does. So there seemed to be something weirdly humanizing about the fact that it was filtered through my personal um, uh, you know, sensibility. But the other thing is it was, and this was sort of like still in a little bit of a, like more of a kind of post 9-11 era. And so I was just shocked that nobody ever stopped me. You know, like I would, other people would come with me sometimes and they would be like, well, nobody, you could be taking these. I mean, I did it at, at LAX airport, which is a major security target. I did it at Bob Hope airport, which is the goofy name they gave the, they gave the airport in Burbank. Um, and no one ever, no one looks up. So that was sort of interesting too, you know, but I mean, I can probably show you it. Let's see if I, let's see if I, um, I'll see, I'll see if I can get it on their website and show you a little bit. I think it's on there. Um, yeah, so, so, so I had a friend who actually worked at Amazon and she sneaked me in to several buildings so that we could spy on them because it seemed important that you have Amazon people in it too. Yeah, here it is. Um, I, let me go back to sharing. So, th so, so this was actually a project I was already doing, you know, that I had sort of been doing for a couple of years. And um, all of the video in um, the Amazon piece, like one friend um, 
did a piece about this guy, Josh Rosenstock, who's this great artist. He made one of the videos for me. Um, he found unsecured webcams around the world. Some of them were on purpose, like watching the baby panda get born. And some of them were just not password protected, like UC Berkeley um, science computing labs. And he makes this, he made this piece that if you, if you go there and you see it, it makes these time lapse videos from the unsecured webcams and it scans around the world and every Monday it restarts. And so they get longer and longer and longer and then they reset the next week. This other artist that I collaborated with, Dara Byrne, um, he's from Dublin, I met him when we were both working on the Microsoft Sense Cam, which was this experimental camera from Microsoft that you wear around your neck. He wore that also all over the world and created this infinite loop that constantly reshuffles that seems to be this long walk that goes on forever. Um, through all these cities. Um, yeah, everything in it was sort of, it was this idea of, um, because it wasn't public art, um, for some reason, they were very hands-off on my content. And the other thing that's uh, interesting about um, corporate commissions, although I'm much, I'm much more comfortable working in the public realm, or I mean with you know public agencies, is they don't have a 20% rule. So, you know, usually for public art commissions, the artists can only get 20% and it's more like making something for a gallery. But yeah, so this was the, this was like the opera in Berlin. Nobody looks up, that's what I've noticed. But see how this would be creepy if you saw the photos. Yeah, it is interesting how much friendlier Big Brother seems when he's working with a ballpoint pen or, or whatever your drawing tool is. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like a fine point, something or other. They're, yeah, they're just like, um, I think they're pit, maybe an ink artist comes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you can, it, well, I said I was spent too long ago. Yeah, this is uh, from the High Line in New York, looking down on Manhattan. I look up now. After, so, uh, yeah. Well, I see that you know my colleague Jakob is on here, and he's he's very interested in in uh, public space and the, the intersectionality of you know informal space and and people and buildings and. This is Heathrow, right? That's supposed to be like super. Like somebody should have said, "Why are you taking?" I mean, I had a big camera too. It wasn't like my phone. It was a, a big SLR camera. This is Seattle. So one of the things that I'm really interested in doing is, is trying to not have any assumptions of what public art should be. And you know, like, so in this case, I mean, I don't know, it, it was different because the conversations with Amazon were different. Like basically they fly you up and they put you in a really, really fancy hotel and you're not competing against anyone because like they don't like your idea, they pay you to do another one. So it was a little bit different, but, um, but I have found like, like with the, the posters about the um, East LA um, and Pasadena High School walkouts, um, they were heavily vetted and we had a lot of conversations. And I agreed with the reasons that they wanted to heavily vet them. There had been um, some problems on the bus. You know, there've been people, um, they had issues with people fighting or there'd been some bullying. And I certainly, I wanted to share out the story of high school student activism. Oh, that must be something that's still on. Sorry about that. Um, I wanted to share out these, what I felt were these really, um, I, well, one of the reasons I was really interested in it was like the era of the Parkland movement. And I wanted to empower high school student um, advocates that are too young to vote, you know, to reinforce this, their, them that they can um, express themselves and, and work for their rights um, through protest um, by showing them these earlier models. But um, but you know, there are things that like, you can't talk about, like when I worked for the county elections, there was nothing partisan that I was ever allowed. We had to be so far from anything partisan that it was unbelievable. You know, and when I was making the, the artwork for the bus, um, we just had to discuss it a lot. Like, we, like, like Pasadena, California um, was very famously desegregated by federal court order. It was found in violation of Brown versus the Board of Education in 1970 by and then there was and then they you know they they um they brought in buses and and they um and there were it was a fairly unsuccessful program but you know they but they the first thing that you see if you look on wikipedia is that um pasadena public schools because of redlining and housing discrimination had a history of discrimination but we but we still had to have a lot of conversations about um how to handle that on you know how, like how to talk about that 
um, for the bus stop audience. But one thing I really like about history projects is you can talk about issues that are still ongoing that might be partisan and might be controversial, but you're talking about something that happened 50 years ago. Um, and, and you can talk about it in a way that raises questions that you want people to consider about things that are still happening um, or give support, you know, like, like just like that student that made his poster in Spanish to give a shout out to the Latinx community. That was a completely nonpartisan project. And it, it wasn't excluding anyone, but it that was a way to be inclusive. So um, when I, you know, in the beginning, when I started doing public art, I was a college professor and I showed a lot of museums and galleries. And it was just this thing that I was doing as a sideline to see if I liked it. But but now it's my, it's really my whole thing. And, and particularly um, in this era of COVID with the galleries closed for the last year and a half. And, and also I think a lot of people having more awareness of how unequal access to arts and culture institutions is across the community. I don't, I don't really want to have anything be separate anymore. And so that's part of why I want to show you um, those other projects that I do as much as possible with public money and in public space and as, and as accessible as possible to a wide audience. Because I feel like if, if cities and counties and states and, and government agencies are going to hire artists, come out of their studios and make public works, we, we should be you know, we can be great accessories to design. And I have, I've had great relationships with architects and with, um, and with the design teams, but I also wanna bring my point of view. And I think that, you know, in the very beginning of doing public art, it was intimidating. It was the most money I ever made. You know, I was worried about these broad constituencies that are very different than expressing yourself in the gallery. But, um, but, but now that I've spent a few years learning how to navigate that, it's, what's really exciting to me is to, create a platform for other voices or to create work where you can tell stories that um, that that help um, create a much more um, inclusive sense of who the public is. So yeah, so sometimes it's a lot of negotiation, but I think it's worth it. It's, it's a lot of work to figure out how to take your studio things that you just made by hand without having to tell anybody ahead of time what you're gonna make and, um, and translate that into a process that's very much pre-visualized and about, um, and about um, giving everybody confidence about the maintenance and safety and longevity. And it's also a lot of work sometimes to take government agencies, which might be a little bit risk averse, understandably. Um, they're in the public eye, they're using public funds and to maybe push the envelope a little bit of what um, we might be able to do. But, um, but I think it's really satisfying, so. Any other questions? Inviting other questions, please. Oh, I didn't look at the chat. There isn't any. You, I will literally answer any question. I, I was struck just, it, it seems like there's a kind of a, the same spirit at work in the neural architecture and all the way down into the voting art project that that is that it seemed to have this kind of there were like these central nodes you know with the, with the the individual that then made their artwork about the person that inspired them and then that was a story about someone else that was then you know it's like the, each one of these sort of was a nexus of like information that that one then seemed naturally attached to this larger kind of organism that was growing with all the other stories and pictures. And, and I thought, I don't know, do, do, does that seem internal to, to all of your projects that they, they're, they're kind of structurally designed to create this kind of interconnectivity? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you see it that way, because I feel like that. I feel like there's a through line. But like when I used to show in galleries, they would just like they were always like, oh, because every four or five years, you know, the um, the formal qualities of my work might change or I might start working in a totally different way or like you know in the beginning when I started um well actually it was how I'd always worked when I was young like with the sort of more representational drawing but when I returned to it it was it was as much as anything a strategy just to engage a wider public that didn't necessarily connect as much with more abstract um work so I see it as all related but yeah like I think on the surface it might look different but that's how I work with communities too like if I um like I have a project right now that I'm doing in Raleigh North Carolina that's got a huge community engagement 
um, element. And it's exactly what you described. I try to meet a few people that are like the human nodes, you know, that are like influencers and connectors. And then they introduce me to more and more people. And then as more people meet me, it sort of branches out exactly like those diagrams that I showed. And, um, and when I was, um, doing, I didn't, there's tons of work I didn't show you guys, but like, um, when I, I, for two years, I was the, um, visiting artist at the um, Memory and Aging Center in the neurology department at UC San Francisco because I was really interested in my, all of my work has a through line of being about sort of like memory and yeah, yeah um, overlap between like social systems, technological systems and, um, and human and human communities and human networks. And so I, I also learned a lot about neural networks and, and it's this, and, and they seem very much a metaphor for um, human social systems too. And I like to think of of community almost as a as an organism together, you know. Um, so yeah, I love that you saw that because um, I, I you know um, I wish you could we could go back in time and you could explain it to my gallery because they would, <laughs> like this work looks totally different. I don't know who the collectors would be for it, but yeah, um, I, I I think that you know first when you were reading the quote that uh, might be from um, an old bio of me. Um, I was thinking, I don't even know if that relates anymore. You know, I don't know if I try to make um, invisible worlds visible, but I think I do. I just used to try to make invisible worlds of the, of the mind and of surveillance and of, um, of uh, the microscopically small, you know, inner body or, or uh, you know, things that were like literally you couldn't see them visible. And now I'm really interested in making things that are um, creating a metaphor for looking at, you know, the way that we're all interconnected or. Um, I mean, on just an obvious level, I think I, for some reason, I always like to make things made of like lots and lots and lots of tiny parts. And so, um, and so when, um, so when I was working for, in my LA County voter job, I literally thought of my art material as being all the voters in LA County, you know, and, and how could I engage as many of them as possible into creating something that, that gave you a sense of the vast scope and complexity of all of the different communities that make up voting in LA. So, and in particular, I was reaching out to like low wealth communities, communities of color, LGBTQ, you know, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness, formerly incarcerated. Like there were so many groups, many of whom were like um, not visible to each other. And so, yeah, I guess it's, I guess I'm still trying to do the same thing, like make that visible to all of the voters because even though LA is really diverse, we can be sort of segmented and not, you know, and and um and not necessarily think of the entire public when we're thinking about what would be best for the community. And so um yeah, I love I love that comment. Yeah, I think I'll uh jump in and ask a follow-up question to that question, right? So the question then is how do you know when you're done? If uh if the uh, the individuals you meet are connectors when will that connection sort of end and or is it even important to have an end right right yeah so it's usually externally um driven like the projects for buildings kind of end when the building opens although like so for santa monica fire department i just, I was the artist in residence for them until, well, the building opened in 2020. So that was sort of like the natural cutoff, you know, that's what like, like I, I but for that, I got hired in 2015. So really from 2015 to 2019, I would go there, hang around, eat dinner and go on calls. A lot of times I was doing that project, not for any really compelling civic art reason. I was just kind of like, I would just go there to get cheered up because it's really fun, you know, riding around on calls and feeling like you're part of helping people. Um, when I was working on 365 days of voters, that project had an end date that was the election. And so every night as we got closer and closer, I would post um, six um, voters. And, you know, that project was supposed to be about LA County, but then once COVID um, had a, made a shutdown and we seriously shut down here, like we really weren't supposed to go out of our homes, um, it became a social media project. And once it became a social media project, it went nationwide. And there even was one person from Europe because an expat because people started sharing it with people. And there's actually a map. I mean, we made a website. If you go to 365daysofvoters.com and it shows you where all the participants were from. So that one, um, it, it had a date, you know, it was going to end when the polls closed on um, November 3rd, but it didn't have a real boundary in terms of how many people. So eventually I had all these people that had sent me headshots and their reasons for voting. We made a Google form where you could upload everything. 
And at the end, the last day, I just posted like three people every hour until I got through all the people because um, I didn't want anyone who had wanted to participate not be included. Um, for the justice drawings, where the drawings I make for the families. So these families um, that I've been working with, um, you know, um, they have a, a really particularly um, uh, like a difficult kind of loss to heal from because um, people who have lost a loved one to, um, to you know, uh, law enforcement violence, putting the politics as, you know, aside for a moment, um, they, they don't get the same kind of grief and loss support that you or I would get if we had a loved one that was, that was killed because a lot of the times the person who was the victim of the shooting is criminalized. You know, the conversation becomes about like, what did they, you know, did they have any criminal record? Did they have a pocket knife? You know, like, and, and, um, and the, the it's, so it's very hard for these families to heal because they're put into a defensive position of having to defend the loved one that they lost. And so I've been making these drawings for them that are, that separate the person from the terrible thing that happened to them and are just like showing them as this, beloved, goofy, relatable, you know, um, silly, strong, vulnerable person that they were. And, um, and I give the drawings to the um, families as a gift because um, often, you know, a young person in their life, you just don't, they don't necessarily have even good photos of them. They might just have really low res small pictures from an Instagram feed and it just gives them something they can have to hang on their wall. And when something like this happens to, the, to a family, they're just in shock and they're disoriented and it may be like one grace note is that this artist gives you this handmade artwork and for free and you know you can you can post it you can make t-shirts of it you, you know give them all the rights and so that project I would love to say there's an end date for it you know that I think that in 2022 we won't I won't have to make drawings for them anymore but um I don't I don't really see it uh, you know like I I've drawn about eight I've made drawings for 18 families and um, I keep meeting more families. But usually if it's for a building or something, the building opens and that, oh, it's hard sometimes. It's like breaking up with somebody, but it's, um, you know, you're so, you're so intensely involved. It's, it's the same with having an exhibition though. You know, like the thing we always say, I used to say when we when I made installations was, well, you know, an hour before the people show up, you have to stop working on it. You know, I try to do it 24 hours before that. But yeah, it's a really good question because a lot of these things are ongoing. And I actually, now that I um, do so much community engagement, I tend to not have my relationship with the community end. Sometimes I'll come back and do another project with them. Like Rancho Los Amigos um, National Rehabilitation Hospital. And that's a wonderful place. It's really a beautiful supportive community. But once they meet you, they hook you in for life, man. You're like always giving them art for their art auction. You're always coming back to their events. I can't tell you how many times before COVID I would come back for something and stand in front of that artwork and explain it to people at their big open house. So yeah, um, but I, I love that. You know, the thing I didn't like about the version of being an artist that I got from art school was this removed from society that you had to go be in this art world. And and um and I um I like making stuff. I need a certain amount of downtime by myself in the studio. It's really important for me, but I also feel I get lonely. And so on, like to, more than anything during COVID, doing this work with communities really saved me. You know, I think that the isolation would have been, it would have made me feel like the thing I chose to do with my life didn't have value compared to a healthcare worker or somebody else working for change. And so it's been really, it's really renewed my um, uh, commitment and excitement about being an artist to think that it's a way for me to be in communities and to make connections with people who I, I might not have intersected with otherwise like really deep connections. That's what I love about public art and that's my vision for it. So I'm super committed to it. So you have a, a question in the chat that kind of follows on that from okay. Romy. Listening to you talk about all your work, I can't help but ask, how do you manage the work-life balance? I mean, I guess I would say like the main way I manage it is by like not really having one. And so, um, and that sounds terrible, but what I really mean is like the people that I work with, like the clients and public art project managers and the communities I work with, like the, I, I like the boundaries to be really fluid, you know? So like one of my, um, 
my, like several of my favorite project managers have become really close personal friends, even though they moved on and don't work for those cities or sometimes they don't even work in public art anymore. And like the families that I'm working with now, you know, they come over to my house for dinner, I come over to their house for dinner. Like we do a lot of other things together. Um, I mean, I think that's the thing, that's always been the thing about art, right? Though, Cause there's like this social requirement that you go to like art openings and you're, you know, your life is sort of like, a lot of your life takes place within there's a you know like you're 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 at an art opening but you're also kind of promoting yourself or whatever if you don't find a way to turn that around and have that be a source of deep um connection with people i think you're going to just feel totally stretched thin but i do things like i do a lot of, i go hiking a lot i'm fortunate to live in california where if things aren't on fire we have like year-round access to nature that's a big if though that's a huge caveat right now things aren't on fire knocking on wood down here um and uh and i try to do non-art things with people but like one thing i love about these the families i've been working with too is that they do that within their movement so there's a so they go for hikes or they'll have they have, they'll have like christmas in july or just like they have all these things that they do um just to be a family and so um I guess maybe that's the model like it's not it doesn't feel like impaired work-life balance if you feel like you're you have a community with the people and it's a kind of a, a family but yeah sometimes I I take a day off and read I I go visit my parents when I'm it's been hard under COVID right everything's been very scrambled up so I think uh yeah that's a good question I, I'll get back to you okay what else what's the most oh public guard application Okay, um, hmm. So I don't really know, except for the times that I'm asked to be on panels, what's the most important element of a public art application because I'm usually on the other side of it, pounding on a door and being confused about why it sometimes opens and sometimes doesn't. But, and so I'm usually on panels where we're interviewing the artists less than looking at all of the applications. But I can tell you that if I was on your panel, the thing that stands out to me is if you speak with your own voice and if it doesn't seem like you took a professional practices class at university that told you what to say so that it's like from a template and, um, and, and just some sort of sense of the person. And, and, and the other thing too is, um, and I don't know, this could be the worst advice in the world because I'm not sure this is always true, but I'm always just looking for uh, a person, a, a point of view. And so I, if I'm on the panel, I don't care if the person necessarily has a lot of public art experience. I try to see into what they make, how that could translate, just like the translations I was showing you. Because I think the easy part is taking the seed, you know, that's the core of their practice and figuring out who could they work with that could help keep the integrity of that, but make it into something long lasting that's appropriate for the, these audiences that are different from the gallery audience, you know, that's, um, that's durable and permanent, that's scaled up to be in these really big spaces. You know, I think that's the easy part. The hard part is, um, is having an authentic voice and something that you want to say. Um, and I think that's why we have public art, right? Not just to have accessories to, um, to things that architects make that make the building more beautiful, but I mean, that's great, but also, to, um, to take this, all these sensibilities and, and experiences and, and viewpoints and capacity for empathy and you know everything that an artist has and have them really try to bring it over into the public space, which is, which is really hard, but so I'm looking for that. And so I would say as much as you, I mean, it's really great to have someone else read your letter and to look at your portfolio. Um, it's try to tell a story. I would say it's more important to try to really help people understand a few projects than to show everything that you're capable of doing, but hopefully trust that the people looking at it, you know, like remember that, try to have, try to think of that they're going to look at a lot, a lot of stuff, and you just want them to understand how you're you, who you are, you know, and, and if that can come through at all, like, like, like a lot of times it's just one or two out of 20 images or 10 images that we're just curious about and we want to bring the person in to ask them questions. And sometimes um, somebody will propose something and we've given them the commission and, and we say like, we like you, but we don't like that. And that's not even what we have, you know, we asked them to make something else, but we just saw something. And so it's, it sounds like really dumb, like up with people, like be yourself advice, but I don't have any better advice because I always vote for that always. And if I feel like, they're sort of like a design firm or a wannabe art architect and they're looking for like the cheapest way to make something that that ticks all the boxes i vote vigorously against it but i'm not on all the panels 
Sounds like great advice to me. <laughs> can, I, can I just add on to that just a little bit? And just listening to you say that also eloquently, like the other benefit to trying to be so authentic and so yourself is that if you get it, you'll be proud of what you did because you did something authentic. And if you didn't do it, at least you didn't compromise your values and lose any opportunity. And I'll even emphasize that more because these public art projects, they're just like the black hole that sucks up your whole life. I mean, every project really is going to just totally dominate your attention and your energy for like two to five years. Like by the, by the time you finish the project, you can't even remember when you weren't working on this, you know, and there's going to be some parts that are so stressful because like something's going to change about the building and maybe they have to move your piece to another place. Like all this stuff is going to happen. That's it. So you'd better be making something that's really worth it to you. Like, like I think in the beginning, I didn't think of public art as my real work and my studio work was my real work because the art audience was maybe like my real audience. And granted, I can do, I can make something formally innovative and the art audience was sophisticated enough to understand exactly what I was going for. And I can put something in a gallery space and that's this controlled space where you're not gonna be taken by surprise and you know you can be much more controversial, you can be much more opinionated in that space because it's kind of like got these quotation marks around it. You know, you already understand that the person's talking from their point of view. So in the beginning, that freedom um, made me feel like that was my real work. But later, as I got more engaged with public art, you know, this idea of having access to like the 90 or 80% of all people that don't go to art galleries and museums made that feel more like my more work like that art that that audience was more exciting to me than saying knowing having a higher chance of knowing that I would be understood within the gallery but um but don't kid yourself like you're only going to live for however many years you'll get to do so many projects a year you better be really really invested in this and you're going to have to fight for it so you don't want to propose something that you think is just something someone else is going to like just to get the money because by the end of the day even though it sounds like a lot of money it's it's not that much money it might you know it might be spread over three years it's you know it better be your real work you want to have it in your portfolio you want to be you want to be proud of it to talk about it it's going to be there when you're dead so you better you know you better really it better stand for you that's what i kept thinking of with the with the windows um for the fire department i was like you know because they would say like why'd you choose that guy or why did you choose him like you know this guy doesn't like him because you know, i drew real people right and and i was like uh you know what you guys this is going to be there when we're all dead and and uh so we don't have to worry about that you know nobody's going to remember who these people were <laughs> but that's intimidating right so you better yeah i mean we've um, arrived at the witching hour so yeah kind of this is that i think that's actually a great summation you know it's like remember this is this is going to last after you so if it's not reflecting who you are what is what's it for right at this point i'm pretty old so i always just think of every you get up in the morning right and this is your one and only life and so yeah. make your mark you know and try to do something valuable well thank, thank you, you so much for joining us today it was great having you and uh hey we hope to see you in oklahoma again sometime I would love, I, I, would, I haven't been for a while. I love Oklahoma, I would love to come back. Well, it's time to come back. So let's, let's find a way to make that happen. Thanks to everyone else. Uh, Kayla, Yakum, Audrey. Oh, Tony, anybody Kelly. that might wanna ask any other questions or if they were shy or if they just wanna ask like something specific like the name of you know the glass fabricator or something, you can email me through my website, deborahashheim.com. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting now and jump to my next Zoom. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, have fun.